So our next speaker um, is Andrea Hendon, um, local talent. Andrea is a clinical hematologist and an early career research scientist um, right here in Hurston. She completed her clinical and laboratory hematology fellowships in 2013 and is employed as a senior staff specialist in hematology and transplantation right here in Hurston. Um, she gained her PhD in 2019, examining transplantation immunology and the role of immune signaling molecules in post-transplant um, outcomes under the, under the supervision of someone we all know quite well, uh, Professor Jeff Hill at, at QIMR Berghofer. So um, Andrea now works in the, trans, in the Translational Cancer Immunotherapy Laboratory at QIMR Berghofer, and her current research focuses on genomic and immune influences on bone marrow transplantation and cellular therapy outcomes. Welcome, Andrea. Okay, so thank you very much for having me to speak this afternoon. I think I'm lucky in that quite a few of the themes that I'm going to talk about this afternoon have already been touched on by some of our presenters already. And so what I'd really like to talk about this afternoon is some work we're doing in, in the microbiome and in transplant outcomes. I think it's one of the areas in medicine where the data regarding the influence on microbiome and patient outcomes is probably most mature. But what we're really moving now is into an era where that's not just an, an, an observational association, that we're actually being able to use that as a therapy in this concept that microbes aren't all pathogens, and that in fact, we might have some exciting therapeutic opportunities to use to improve these outcomes. Um, they're my disclosures. So as I said, there's now really a good wealth of data showing that the, the not just the diversity, but even down to now the species level, that, that microbes in our gut really do influence transplant outcomes. So this is from a, a, a slightly old review now, in fact, showing the range of, of microbes that have a known association with transplant outcomes, be it protective or pathogenic. So in the red, obviously, are the ones that are more likely to be pathogenic, and you can see that there are ones associated with increased infection risk after transplantation. Um, things like the uh, recognised association with Enterobacteriaceae, in fact, in terms of overall survival after transplantation, um, and then with certain infectious um, and other immunological complications, including graft-versus-host disease. But equally, there are a range of microbes that actually have protective roles here, and we'll talk through some of the, the, the um, data for that and the, the, rate, the ways that we can potentially use that as a therapeutic strategy. So this is from some of the, the, the early seminal papers coming out of uh, MSK, which really did show that reduced microbial diversity in, in, the, in the gut related to your, your transplantation outcomes. So we can see here, this was in the American series on the left and then in a, in a European um, series on the right to confirm the observation that the more diverse microbiome you had in your gut, the better your survival was after a bone marrow transplant. So this was really sort of thought provoking data and has led to sort of a number of other studies really trying to quantify the, the mechanisms that, that drive that outcome difference and then the ways the actual immunological influences that cause that. So we can see that a large portion of the, the um, changes in outcomes are related to the incidence of acute graft versus host disease being one of the major toxicities of transplant. Um, I suppose one of the big differences in, in allo transplant compared to solid organ transplant is, is that allo antigen recognition, and in that case, we're wanting to preserve the graft versus leukemia effect, but the graft versus host disease is one of the major complications and, and causes of morbidity in our patient population. So we can see here related in these in, in this example to, to Blautia um, a predominance in the, in the gut that you would have... Uh, more GVHD if you had uh, more, more blouty, it would be more severe, and this could affect your um, not only your gut, but actually the incidence of GVHD in the skin. So suggesting that these weren't just observations that were limited to the flora in the gut. These, were, these, these, these species in the gut were actually having an influence on the systemic um, immunology of transplant. <laughs> And importantly, this is something that we've probably been affecting for a long time without necessarily thinking about it. So in an earlier case series, it in fact looked at the range of antibiotics that were used and the impact that that had on both GVHD incidence and overall survival after transplant. So we can hear there, see here that some of the, and I'm sorry, the slide hasn't come out particularly well, um, but there are some uh, antibiotics that don't have a big influence on, on GVHD, but we can see here that PIPTAS in fact does have a big in influence on the incidence of GVHD, 
and, and the chance of patients dying or surviving their GVHD. And conversely here, we can see that some of these, the use of these antibiotics was associated with changes in the predominance of different microbial species. So what can we do about this? Well, fecal transplant's probably one of the, uh, the bluntest tools I suppose we can use to directly influence the, the gastrointestinal microbiome. Um, it's been used for many years um, for uh, therapy of Clostridium difficile is probably where it's got its greatest um, evidence base. But equally, it has been used also for eradication of multi-resistant organisms in the transplant field to try and ensure that patients are at less risk of infection. Um, but in this instance, it was actually being used to try and influence the GVHD outcomes. So this is from a, a small case series where they looked at um, giving a faecal transplant. In this case, it was from a, um, a, a bank stool product. Um, and you can see here, they've recorded with, when the antibiotics were used, but overall it was really striking. Those who um, received a faecal transplant and responded really did have much better survival. So really saying that this is an effective therapy. So it's in this context that I wanted to bring this into our patient population um, in transplant. I think steroid refractory gut GVH is probably one of our um, hardest transplant complications to deal with and certainly causes not, not just morbidity but mortality in our patient group. Um, and coincidentally, I think one of the, the barriers to instituting this, particularly in an immunocompromised population, is, is the potential risk of transfer of pathogens. So Lifeblood have actually now got a um, TGA license and a GMP manufacturing facility in Perth uh, where they will collect stool from, from healthy donors. Um, being the um, being Lifeblood also being our, our source of, of blood products, they've obviously got a good um, infrastructure around screening for multi-resistant organisms, patient screening and um, safe. So that all of that sort of uh, structure has been leveraged to the stool bank, probably with even more stringent um, donation criteria and multi-resistant organism screening. So they have this um, stool product, um, as I said, that's got a TGA license for therapy of C. diff. And so this seemed a natural uh, co collaboration for us to put together this clinical trial, which has just been run as a pilot um, at the Royal Brisbane Hospital at the moment. So we're really targeting in our transplant group, those who've had their transplant and have already experienced development of, of uh, severe gut GVH and particularly those who don't respond to frontline steroids. So this, this is our patient with the highest unmet medical need. Um, we'll collect some stool and some, and some blood and some serum before we give them an FMT, um, which is derived from, the, the, um, from an unrelated voluntary donor from the Lifeblood um, stool bank, um, and then look at their clinical outcomes, as well as the effect that the FMT has on their stool microbiome, and then on what we believe to be the real effect of molecules in terms of the immunology, which are the short chain fatty acids. Um, so this, this as, as far as we know, is an Australian first. So it was all very exciting when we had the first uh, patients treated on the ward. Um, we've treated three out of our intended 10 patients on the trial. So I'm sorry, I don't have any outcome data for you today, but I can, can definitely tell you from those three patients that the FMT has been very uh, safely administered. Um, we have seen some uh, febrile neutropenia in those patients, but they are patients who are otherwise at high risk of febrile neutropenia. And so far, we wouldn't have seen, we haven't seen any infections that we would consider atypical. Um, and there's good, some early evidence of response um, in, in all three of those patients so far. But I think what's really exciting about doing trials like this is not just the, the potential improvement we can, we can bring to patient outcomes, but to really understand, well, what's this doing? What's the effect of it? Because I think in the long term, we'd like to probably move away from using a, a, bulk, you know, a product like FMT and can we provide something more nuanced? So I just want to present a, a few bits of data that, that are not mine, but really do, I think, start to speak to what we understand about what role the microbiome has in, in both immune function in health and disease and how we can use that as a, as a therapy. So as I mentioned, short chain, chain fatty acids are, are microbially derived metabolites um, that have the ability to pass through the, the GI barrier and actually influence immune cell function. So this is data from... from um, uh, Kate Markey, who actually did train at the Royal Brisbane Hospital as well. She's now at the Fred Hutch, looking in the context of chronic graft versus host disease, that if you actually, you can measure that there are differences in short chain fatty acid levels in patients who have and do not have um, chronic graft versus host disease. 
And just to highlight, the chronic graft versus host disease actually infrequently affects the gastrointestinal tract. It's much more likely to affect the skin, eyes, other and more oral mucosa, uh, and also uh, lung. What are these short chain fatty acids doing? Well, they're probably actually influencing the way our T cells function. Um, so T cells sort of can be split up into a range of, um, if you like, very broadly, good guys and bad guys. Um, some are involved in more inflammatory immune responses, some with more regulatory roles. And so short chain fatty acids actually have the ability to influence your, your in, intrinsic T cell function and potentially um, it, sway it towards a more protective uh, um, milieu. And not only that, it probably has the short chain fatty acids probably also have an ability to actually directly affect the function of the GI barrier itself. So in this study, you could see that depending on the exposure to short, different short chain fatty acids and which was a concentration dependent effect, that you could actually induce genetic expression and then subsequent protein expression of the tight junctions that actually bind the GI cells together to form the GI barrier. So we know, as, and as Monica has mentioned, obviously mucositis and, and the, um, the damage that's caused through both conditioning chemotherapy and radiotherapy uh, often represents a portal for infection and translocation of bacteria from the gut to the bloodstream. Well, these are direct ways in which short-chain fatty acids may actually be able to restore that barrier uh, and reduce that risk for patients. And more interestingly, I've, I've had the um, listen to some really elegant biology talks recently where it's probably actually exposure to the microbiome and some of the, the micro, microbially derived metabolites, which are actually really intrinsic in informing um, immune tolerance. Um, so some of these are uh, cell populations, T regulatory cells and innate lymphoid cell populations, which are really central to immune tolerance to pathogenic versus commensal bacteria are all dependent upon the exposure in the gut. Through, through microbiota. So it's evidence that it's involved directly in local pathology in the gut, that it can affect systemic levels and T cell function, um, and also probably has a very big role in, in development of normal immunity and, and immune tolerance. So that's very exciting, and there's lots more I could talk about there. Um, but, but I think what we're really understanding now is this is not just a, a, a topic for transplantation medicine. Um, some nice articles now actually showing that the uh, micro gastrointestinal microbiome influences the uh, therapeutic efficacy of some of our newer T cell therapies. So transplant, I suppose, representing the original immune therapy. But now we've got checkpoint inhibition, making very big changes in how we treat solid organ malignancies. And CAR T cell therapy is an adoptive T cell therapy. And equally, T cell, adoptive T cell therapies for uh, persistent infections is a novel developing area as well. And so we have a program through QIMR looking at viral specific T cells. And indeed, you know, I think it's yet to be shown that microbiome is important in those T cell outcomes, but really this theme that it's important as um, in T cell effector function. Um, and equally, probably even in frontline chemotherapy, not just in immune therapy, the micro oops, sorry, uh, the microbiome being a, a determinant of, of clinical outcomes. So I think this is really um, an emerging role in all of cancer therapy and probably not just even in cancer therapy. So this is a really uh, lovely article that actually says probably the gut microbiome can even influence um, um, tumorigenesis in the GI tract, and particularly because the GI tract is a, is a rapidly turning over mucosal um, epithelia. So I think these are really sort of brewing issues that we've only very recently had the appropriate scientific tools to interrogate, and there's lots of really interesting unanswered questions about how important the microbiome is in health and disease. So I think I've hopefully given you some interesting thinking points about why the gut microbiome is so important, not just in cancer therapy, but in immunology as well. We've got evidence that in transplant, we can influence the rates of acute and chronic graft versus host disease. Um, the role for eradication and potentially prevention of an infection with multi-resistant organisms, and we've talked about febrile neutropenia being one of our very common clinical problems, and the actual function of the GI barrier and microbial trans translocation um, we know that it's important in efforts in therapeutic efficacy of, in fact, many cancer therapies now, and that's spanning both cellular immunotherapies and checkpoint inhibition. Um, and, and this understanding that it probably actually underpins some of the um, uh, other autoimmune um, inflammatory pathologies, 
looking at the recognition and distinction between our immune responses to commensal versus pathogenic microbes. And there's some great evidence as well for things like asthma susceptibility being um, determined by early, um, possibly even maternal microbiome and, and short chain fatty acid exposure. But equally, all of this represents a real new sort of therapeutic opportunity, I think, either using blunt tools like FMT or potentially, as we've heard from Samuel, and you'll hear from um, Sarah, one of our dietitians this afternoon, but potentially using um, more fibre-containing supplements, in which way you then support um, more protective organisms within the gut, um, or maybe even cutting, trying to really understand the effect of molecules and maybe being able to even just use a more refined product. Um, so, like a few others today, I think I think the answers to these questions are only really going to be um, achieved if we work together. And look, I think there's a long list of people here. Despite our little trial uh, pilot trial of ten, there's a lot of people who've been involved um, to be able to do the, the sort of effective translational research that I think will answer these questions. So, you know, for this project alone, looking at cellular and soluble immunology, metagenomic sequencing of the stool, and then metabolomic methods. Um, and so here are all the people who've been involved in getting this project up and running. And that would go without saying that I must thank the, the people who funded this, uh, my research, and also this particular project. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Um, that was a brilliant talk. Uh, look, I was quite compelled by your data depicting uh, GBHD-related outcomes for different antimicrobials. And I couldn't help but notice that, you know, kefepime versus piptazo um, biologically speaking, you know, related possibly related to sort of the the anaerobic activity um, of piptazo. We often use kefepime in the setting of penicillin, um, you know, allergy. What what are your thoughts in terms of is the data strong enough? And also weighing up um, sort of problems with using kefepime in terms of you know not having enterococcal activity um, over piptazo. You know, with respect to microbiome outcomes in GVHD. Yep. Um, so look, great question. And I think this is one where I, I would probably in the first instance say that I don't think we've got enough data yet to really change clinical practice, but I think it is something that we do need to be looking at. I, I think also we know that probably the microbiome, you know, we probably can pay more attention to the microbiome of the patients going in to, to both transplant, but even prior to, to their conditioning. Um, so that the data does suggest that there's, you know, potential detrimental effects of using third generation cephalosporins. And certainly in, in the FMT context, um, we've written into the trial that if it's, if it's, uh, haven't mandated it, but if it's clinically uh, safe to do so, it would be good to withhold those drugs for both 48 hours before and after the FMT. Um, the role of sort of enterococcus has particularly been noted, sort of having a predominance of enterococcus early after transplant certainly seems to be a bad thing for your transplant outcomes associated with worse GVHD. Um, but so far, most of these have been relatively small case series, and I would caution against sort of um, change of, of clinical practice. But I really do think as, as some of this data becomes more mature, it is going to be really important. Um, you know, we've talked already about early termination of antibiotics, but probably even antibiotic choice is going to be really important um, in, in trying to, you know, change the patient's outcomes. And as much as intervening with something like FMT to correct a dysbiotic microbiome is important, maybe avoiding some of that dysbiosis in the first place through antibiotic use is, you know, will be important. And just as the microphone goes to Ant, just in terms of also, Adam, we have to do it, you know, way earlier, because this happens during AML chemotherapy, way before they get to transplant. And that's another pathway we've been looking at. Great work. Um, I wanted to ask you two questions. Firstly, what was the dosing of your FMT in your study? And second question, um, a lot of the transplant patients, as you know, are very IgA deficient. Um, and there's a very interesting relationship between IgA, IgG and, and microbiota. Um, and are you planning to look at all at IgA in your, in your uh, patients? Um. Yes, so um, dose is a really interesting, interesting question, um, and and that's probably something that even when we think about like CAR T cell therapies and other novel immunotherapies, you know, we don't have great sort of potency assays or measures for these, and certainly the product that we're using um, is, you know, it comes from uh, random but screened donors. Um, it, there's no sort of none of the the, the quality and the um, uh, production endpoints are are really around. 
uh, safety. It doesn't have anything to do with what's actually in the product. So I think that's where there's a push, although FMT does have good clinical efficacy to really try and move towards uh, products where we can more accurately measure exactly what the uh, effector molecule is, what the potency is. And I think that's where sort of moving to, you know, either either if we, if we can really profile organisms that have their own um, therapeutic uh, efficacy that maybe you can move to a single organism preparation and then you'd be able to say there were so many parts per million or, you know, um, by 10 to the 9 per litre, they're the same way that we do for some of the other cellular therapy products, or whether or not you move to a, you know, a, a, a chemical compound that can be quantified in that way. So I think that's one of the issues, some of the, you know, around the different FMT programs, uh, the question has often been, well, who even is the best donor? You know, and so I think really in some ways we don't really know the dose we're providing. It's, a, you know, the, 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 the QC release criteria are more about filtration and, and volume. Um, with regards to your second question, obviously that's uh, certainly something I would love to look at. I think I think uh, and understanding some of the actual um, spatial characteristics between um, where the microbes are. We know that some of the other uh, microbes that are associated with uh, protective effects like acomancia and the mucin uh, layer in the gut um, and, and potentially even understanding what the microbiome is in the lumen versus at the um, interface. And even the microbiome, we know that the sort of um, active you know, particularly in the in the GVHD gut, that there's probably actually translocation of bacteria into the um, draining lymph nodes, and so understanding the sort of spatial role, and I think that's where some of the sort of more developmental biology and understanding of immune tolerance will will start to try and see some of the. It would be nice to look at some of the um, uh, equivalents in disease as well. So yes, it'd be nice to do that work. <laughs> Right, we might move. So, any questions online? Sorry, I can't. I don't think so. No. Okay, so, thank Thanks. you, Andrew.